So we've come to the end of part one of the November Falls sale. I think that it's very inevident here, but you've been clicking on to our Gold Cup preview on Adam. Thank you. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. Not Good. bad at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is fun because I'm interviewing you who normally does the interviewing. Well, there you go. It doesn't happen too often this way around, does it? <laughs> <laughs> so I know you got into racing really from watching the Grand National with your father who's a racing fan. Um, yeah. But did you have horses or did you ride at all? No, no. Hannah, I promise you, I'm not from a racing background at all. So, oh, really? Um, yeah, my dad um, was a big enthusiast. Yeah. I like to bet every now and again on the national and uh, got me to watch the race. I just loved it. And um, he he, um, he sort of, you know, engendered that sort of uh, interest in me. And but both of us were very keen on following racing together. He died a few years ago now, my dad. But, um, yeah, great influence on me. And certainly with the way my life turned out, as I, I suddenly realized that I, I thought racing was fabulous. And um, yeah. if I could get a job in some form of sports journalism, particularly with racing, then I'd, I'd try, try that out. So I did. Um, that was a long time ago now. I never thought I'd end up doing it for the rest of my life. But, but there you go. It's funny how things work out. So have you ever ridden a horse before, ever? No, I hadn't sat on a horse till I was in my 20s. Oh, okay. and uh, I, used to, I used to go for a hack in Richmond Park because I lived in London for a long time. Okay. Uh, Richmond was only a 20-minute drive from me, so... Uh, I used to go hacking out in the Richmond Park every now and again on an enormous great big thing called Bruno. It was almost like part shire horse because oh, wow. I'm, I'm a bit of a lump, so I don't want to be riding racehorses. <laughs> <laughs> so whereabouts in London did you live? Hammersmith. Lived in Hammersmith for a long time. Before oh, that, yeah. up in North London in um, uh, Crouch End, Hornsey area. But uh, Hammersmith is where I felt most comfortable. I loved it around there, W6. Yeah, great yeah. part of the world. Well, that's where I was supposed to be moving until the lockdown happened. So you went to Keele University. I did. I lived yeah. not far from there when I was in Staffordshire. Well, do you know what? Um, Keele was an interesting place because I remember, um, gosh, I, I remember going up there for, for an interview and stuff. And I just, I loved the campus, massive campus. I think it was Europe's or Britain's first US star campus university. Oh, um, and it's a little bit, I mean, the Potteries isn't, you know, it's a little bit of a backwater around there, but it's mm. quiet. And the, the Peak District's on, on your doorstep. It's just a great part of the world from that point of view. Yeah. Met some great people there, still friends with a few of them. Mm. And yeah, yeah, it was just a, I mean, it's a shame that Keel is better known for its service station than it is for its university sometimes, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I know the one, I've been to that one. <laughs> yeah, me too. Well, Many I, think times I went to the... The university, it's got that big old wall, hasn't it? Really, that's right. Yeah, that's, mm. honestly, it, it's the, the Keel Hall where they where it's all built around. Yeah, it's stunning. Um, the woodland area is superb. I mean, it's the first time sorry, the, the last time I saw a red squirrel on well, plenty of them or is it within the woods around Keel University? That's how, how lovely it was. Oh, really? it's like, yeah, they're pretty rare these days, aren't they? Yeah, my granddad used to hate, he hated them, he used to hang dolls and CDs in the we had an orchard and he used to hang all of this stuff in the trees just so that the squirrels wouldn't come they're rodents they're considered like like rats he hated um, them yeah. yeah so when you were at university is this when you wanted to go into resenting for racing or was it still a bit of a unsure path that you wanted to follow well it was it was unsure I mean I, I sort of um I was doing economics and history yeah. because I thought if I got an economics degree, it would help me get a job. Because this was a different time back in the early 80s. And the economy was pretty, you know, struggling a bit. And getting a job after uni was going to be the tough part. Uh, and I worked for a year for the government. I, I got a government job uh, as an economist, effectively. And um, and then I saw an advert one day in the Sporting Life newspaper for a job at Time Form in Halifax. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's when I just thought, I've got to try this, get it out of my system. And I went up to Halifax and had an interview with a chap called Reg Griffin, who's who was in charge of Timeform, superb offices. Um, and I just thought, yeah, this is what I'd like to do. Anyway, long story short, went up there, took a bit of a pay cut, but lived in Halifax for a couple of years. Wanted to be there longer, Hannah, but 
then there was the, the Racing Post was starting up in the mid-80s. There were jobs going in racing journalism there and at the Sporting Life as well. And I ended up joining their weekly newspaper, the Sporting Life Weekender, uh, in 80, late 85. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, it's all went from there. And I still kept thinking, I'm, gonna, I'm just going with the flow here to mm-hmm. see how things pan out. I'm writing about racehorses, being paid to watch it, being paid to go racing. Yeah. Yeah, much better than that. The and, best. Uh, yeah, fabulous, isn't it? What a lucky lad. Anyway, um, no racing background whatsoever, and that's how it all ended up. And you learnt everything at time form. Yeah, I, le- I certainly learnt about um, about h- how horses were handicapped and the breeding and all that type of stuff. Handicapping in particular, and how you know how much of um, a horses weights weights they carry, the weights they the, the way they how far they're beaten, um, different ground factors, that type of stuff. Uh, wait for A's, three-year-olds against older horses. All the technical stuff is like going to the University of Horse Racing up yeah. there. <laughs> so what happens at time form? It's all the analytics, isn't it? Yeah, it's um, it's basically it's a no-frills company. It produces really um, brilliantly prepared guides to jumping and flat racing throughout the year. They produce race cards at all the race meetings. Yeah. Produce something called a black book, which covers the A to Z of all the horses that are around that time and at the end of the year they produce a thing called race horses mm-hmm. in fact if you look behind me just up there at the very top are all the race horses annuals oh wow over the years oh, they're quite that? big then yeah yeah so they're, they're like the bible of racing and i ended up um, doing some work on them as well as, oh, as you wow. do um writing essays for them and stuff so i did um, comments on the older horses on the flat four-year-olds and upwards when i was up there uh, it's just great, great learning curve. It really was. How do they, hand, how do they work out the handicap of a horse? Well, they. Um, it's all about ratings. Each horse has a rating yeah. um, expressed in pounds. Um, that's because we're quite old fashioned, aren't we, in racing? <laughs> and uh, the the best horse ever to have passed through time forms in time form some of the period. Time form been going since the war, Second World War. Founded by Phil, Phil Ball, who was a real form analyst. <laughs> And the best horse that they'd ever, uh, when I joined the company, they'd ever seen was a horse called Seabird, who won the Derby in 1965 and won the Ark very impressively that same year. And he was rated 145, and he was the best around until Frankel came along yeah. and knocked him off his perch. I think Frankel ended up with a rating of 147, two pounds higher than, than Seabird. And other great superstars like Brigadier Gerard was 144. It's just great, and, and so just rating horses on their on their pure ability is what Timeform did, locked into weighting it with different conditions as to how best to produce that form. You know whether the ground's going to suit them, the track, um, all those conditions, the distance, um, and then they produce a rating for each horse in each race, and that would be sold on to uh, to customers. So you said there's a book they they produce A to Z of the horses in yeah, the, the black book. Uh, the Black Book. So, do they still do that now? Yeah, they do. I, I, yeah, I believe they do. Actually, I wonder if they still do. I haven't seen one for ages now, to be honest with you. But um, it was for me, it was fantastic. Mm. I mean, I just got my hands on a Black Book when I was a student. Yeah. But it wasn't it wasn't cheap. It was expensive. <laughs> but, yeah, it was about 15 quid a, a, an issue, which is a lot of money for a, a student, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, mm. I remember getting old ones given to me by people that knew I was interested in stuff. And I remember holding on to these things like they were gold dust. Yeah. But, of course, you know, things soon get out of date and you mm. have to renew. But the annuals that they produce at the end of each year is like a, a, a chronology of the whole of that racing year. Right. And, um, they, they cover lots of issues. In, in the essays on the horses, not just about the horses themselves, but other issues involving racing politics mm-hmm. and other military issues and stuff like that. And so, yeah, fascinating read, all of them, really good. And is that both flat racing and jump racing? Jumps, yeah, they started mm-hmm. doing an annual jumps annual in, in the mid-1970s, I think, yeah. Okay. Oh, look. I, when I was doing my research, what I was most interested about, because I didn't know anything yep. about this particular thing, that you were, is 1988, you were Willie Carson's agent? Yeah, I was Willie's agent for about five years, five or okay. six years, and um, I combined that with my job at the newspaper, so I would be working for Willie in the mornings, mm-hmm. Mason, but early start. I was a single man in those days, Hannah, so I, was, I had the time to myself to yeah. do that. Uh, um, 
But and then I'll be making phone calls for, on Willie's behalf that morning, and then heading off to the office in London, at Fleet, near Fleet Street area in the Chancery Lane, where the Sporting Life is based. And I work for the Life um, from the afternoon onwards until the evening. And I take calls on my mobile, which is like the size of a house, the mobile at the time, <laughs> with an antenna. Um, one of those yeah, ones. Yeah, yeah. massive. It was, it was about the size of a brick. Um, <laughs> I remember think, feeling very important because uh, I was about the only bloke that had a mobile of my age at that time. Oh, really? Yeah, it was, oh, listen, not for long, but um, yeah, it was all business. And then Willie, Willie, at the end of the year, he'd always say to me, he said, in you know, that Scottish accent of his, he'd say, oh, my bill for your phone is way too high, Camel. You've been phoning all your girlfriends on it, he said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, but we had a great few years together but I never made him champion Hannah which is like a big regret of mine Pat Edry was always that bit too strong well, what did it entail for you to be his agent what did you have to do yeah well basically um, he was uh, he was retained uh, at first by a, a guy called Major Dick Hearn it was Willie was his stable jockey and he also rode quite a lot for John Dunlop and once I knew where the uh, Major Hearn and John Dunlop were going to run their horses and where they wanted Willie to go, I would work out where the best chances would be of picking up spare rides. So I'd analyse the the other races in which he wasn't already engaged in and ring round the trainers and try and get Willie on the horses I thought had the best chances of winning. Oh, wow, OK. And it was, I mean, listen, it was great fun and yep. hard work. I mean, often you'd make phone calls for hours on end and get absolutely nowhere. And <laughs> other times, when you would, and Willie yeah. would ring Say what news? <laughs> you say, well, I haven't got any, <laughs> Willie. You know, I've asked about ten rides and got none or one. Right. But other times, people would call you offering. You know, they'd say, "Would Willie like to ride this?" And you'd say, "I'll, I'll let you know in ten minutes or whatever." And mm. but we, yeah, just so long as he was on horses with good chances, that was all we wanted to do. Really, give him the chance of winning and um, notching up as many winners as he could per season. Oh, okay. So then, after was it five years? You said. Yeah, it was, yeah. It so, was five. after that period of time, would then Willie go on to get another agent? So, each jockey has an agent? Yeah, they do. I mean, But he was the first to have one in the 1970s. He, had his, he was the only jockey, I think, to begin with, that had an agent. Right. Lester Piggott used to ring up all the time himself, and, and he'd, he'd jock people off all the time, Lester, because Lester was the king. Yeah. But Willie got this guy to work for him, and when he came to speak to me, they, they'd gone their separate ways. Um, and Willie and I are always arguing about money and stuff. <laughs> I mean, I'm half Scots, he's pure Scots, so we yeah. all knew what our value was. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and in the end, I was just starting to do some commentating on the track, and I was wanting to develop that. So after a while, I, I got fed up answering the phone at 6 a.m. in the morning. And 6 a.m., wow. Yeah, early starts. They, yeah. were, they were early days, Hannah, you know, and um, yeah, it was quite amusing. Um, but anyway, uh, that was that. And but listen, Willie and I are great mates today. It's, yeah. it's great that we're still good pals. But yeah, we had, um, I worked out, we had 700 winners in five years together. Right. That's an average of 140 a year. But yeah. um, the closest we got was Pat beat us by 10. But Pat had a, a full time manager and agent, his brother in law, mm -hmm. to do it for him. And I used to definitely miss out when I was on that way, my way to work on the underground from my home in Hammersmith into. Yeah. No signal. <laughs> No signal, yeah. yeah. I mean, he'd love to see you there. I mean, he is an amazing guy. He's 70, 76, 77 in yeah. November. Yeah. And he's got the energy of a guy half his age. He's yeah. just incredible. I saw him a few months ago. Uh, did a piece with him for Sky Sports Racing. And um, he was in great form, quite top class. But he's had a bit of luck. Yeah, he's done well. Yeah. Bred, bred Minster Sun and rode him to win the St. Ledger. The only jockey ever to breed a horse and then ride him to a classic win afterwards. Oh, How big is that? Yeah. Did you say his wife, she does it too? She and Willie run the farm, run the stud together. Oh, and, and I was just saying to Willie, I rang him about two weeks ago, and he said that all most of the staff live on site, so they haven't been affected by the yeah. by lockdown or anything like that, so that's good. Yeah, because it's probably just a huge, well, for some, I suppose, it's a big change because of the whole social distancing. So do you ever visit any racing yards still? Yeah, frequently. I... I haven't, um, I'm just trying to think when the last time I did a piece on it. I mean, I used to, in the early days, Hannah, I used to get up really early and go and do some um, filming on the gallops and things up at Newmarket or down in Lambourne or whatever. Yeah. Um, I love going around yards because you just see what it's all about. Yeah. That's where all the hard work's done, isn't it? Exactly. Uh, I'm always amazed at the, the way that it's all all sorted out. I love going out of John Joe's as well. John Joe's got a great yard in Jackdaw's Castle near, near Cheltenham. 
Um, Isn't it in Yeah, it's a lovely, lovely spot down there. Yeah. Uh, when the weather's great, there's no nicer place to start the day, particularly if you get a bit of breakfast to follow it afterwards and a chat with yeah. John or whoever it might have been, mm-hmm. Henry, John Gosden or James Fanshawe. I've been in Israel quite a few times. And yeah, there's, there's, there are certain people that when you go there, they make a big fuss of you and it's really, really yeah. lovely. Yeah, well, my mum, she absolutely loves Lambourne Open Day, so we go every year. And obviously that's yeah. a great chance because then you get to go around all the yards um, I love Nicky Henderson's yard. I love it. Nicky, I mean, what a legend he is! I, I mean, know. yeah, he's just such a lovely guy as well, isn't he? Yeah, I mean, I remember because we left super early last year, really early in the morning, and I ended up—I was so happy to be there. I had a burger from the burger van at nine a.m. in the morning, or something stupid like that. I was having <laughs> such a great time. <laughs> <laughs> something that you wouldn't normally do. <laughs> I know exactly. I'm normally really healthy yeah. eating, and there I was having a burger out the burger van. Yeah, I love yeah. it, and especially when it's a nice sunny day. Oh, no, it's nothing better. I mean, I remember, though, on the contrary to this, Hannah, I did a, a pre-Cheltenham visit to Tom George's yard. He trains at a place called Slad in Gloucestershire. Okay. And it never stopped raining all oh. morning. And, I mean, after a while, you just accepted you're going to get absolutely soaked. And yeah. I remember standing there, you know, and we just got so wet and cold oh. at Tom's plans for Cheltenham. And it was quite funny in the end, but... Listen, you dry off, it's only water, isn't it? Exactly. I also read that one of your most memorable interviews was with Sir Henry Cecil. Mm. So what made it so memorable? Obviously, he was ten. He was champion trainer, wasn't he, ten times over. Yeah. Did he train the Queen's horse, racehorse as well? Henry, I don't think Henry ever trained for the Queen. Mm. Um, I don't think he did, Hannah. He certainly trained Frankel anyway. <laughs> yeah. Henry was, a, Henry was a, a living legend, a yeah. man of great charisma and... Um, I was, I was lucky enough to get to know him well enough so that I actually stayed a couple of times at Warren Place, his, his, his legendary training centre, for when I was working up at Newmarket for Channel 4. Henry said to me one day, he said, well, why, do you, why don't you come to a night sometime? It'd be nice to see you, you know? Yeah. Just in that incredibly, you know, throwaway, aristocratic manner. Yeah. I said, well, yeah, Henry, I'd love to. That would be great. And my girlfriend at the time and I went up there and stayed at Warren Place and Henry yeah. cooked a dinner. And, yeah. I mean... Legendary moments for me. I mean, Henry was a god for me. Um, so any interview I did with him was memorable because he was just an incredible guy. Um, and, of course, all three years of Frankel's racing career were qu- covered quite closely by us on Channel 4 Racing at the time. And I was lucky enough to be the you know, the lead presenter of the flat racing um, output those years. Mm-hmm. And uh, so although we ended our coverage on Channel 4, the old Channel 4 team at the end of 2012, it was a great way to finish because Frankel had retired and yeah. used all those great performances. And sadly, alongside that, we saw the deterioration of Henry's health and yeah. he was riddled with cancer. And mm. So brave and stoic as he always was, never made a fuss. No. But um, yeah, and I just, I think Henry, Henry for me, left when he when he passed away, he left a massive gap, a massive yeah. hole in the game. And, yeah, a man of great um, charisma. Mm. He was. I was saying to John Frankham the other day that it's really great that there's YouTube to look yeah. back. Because I was saying when I was watching some of John's races, I said I wasn't even born, so thank goodness for YouTube. Well, I bet John was saying, nah, I can't believe you were born when I was still riding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Have you got any other memorable interviews? Yeah, many that um, went, um, went funny. Um, there was one, I remember years ago, there was a horse running at Doncaster who won called the Gold Xiong Sam. And it was owned by a Malaysian businessman who turned yeah. up in the parade ring in the, in the winner's enclosure. And I was met to interview him on Channel 4. And um, he was with two young ladies who I thought were his daughters. Right. And John and Jim, John Frankham and Jim McGrath were doing the paddock commentary at the time and immediately cottoned on as to what was going on. He'd hired two girls for the day, this fella. Two high class girls. <laughs> oh, really? I thought they were his daughters and kept asking inappropriate questions. Nice to see you here. How old are you? And I could hear Jim and John laughing. They're killing themselves in the background. But it was blindingly obvious that this guy, A, didn't speak much English, right. and B, out there with these two um, high class core girls. Oh, and wow. So, I mean, that was one of the. I remember at the time thinking, I got myself in the right mess here. Yeah. Oh, inappropriate questions but I mean there's usually the funny ones that, uh, that stay with you I tried to interview Khaled Abdallah once and got no response from him because oh. he won a he won the Jobmont International which is a race he sponsors at York for yeah. the first time 
And Henry Cecil had trained the winner and the second, twice over beat midday. And I said to Prince Card, I said, uh, so, sir, congratulations, you've managed finally to win your race. And there was silence. And then I said to him, not only that, you've got first and second. And he was, again, silence. And the third time, I said, and, and, and also trained by your great ally and friend, Sir Henry Cecil. You must be so proud. And he looked at me and he said, what is your question? And um, he had, <laughs> Anyway, I was taken aback by this. Richard Hughes, who was riding for Abdullah at the time, walked by me going out to the next race. And um, he laughed. He said, we were a kid last I was laughing watching you try to interview Abdullah just now. He said, you won't be trying that again in a hurry now, will you? I said, no, I won't. But what was the problem? He said, he's deaf. He doesn't oh. hear a thing. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I don't know. I don't I got a clue. It was live television. And um, it was an awkward moment, Hannah. Yeah. Uh, and then those awkward moments live on television feel really long. <laughs> All of it up, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Open the trap door. So do you remember the first time you ever went live on television? I do, yeah. I was a nervous wreck. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, you, listen, uh, you, you get butterflies um, going on live telly. Of course you do. Yeah. Uh, uh, but if you haven't done it for a bit, if you haven't been in for a few weeks doing it, you still get a bit nervous. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing is, the, the less prepared you are in your head, the more nervous you are. I tell you, if you feel as though you've done all your prep properly, mm -hmm. you're not so nervous. Mm. There's no question that preparation is everything. Do you know what's funny? I get nervous looking at the clock. So you know how you'd have a countdown. So before I do this interview, you know, I try and do it dead on. Yeah. And I'm normally sat here, you know, a couple of three minutes before. But because I'm looking at a clock... I then imagine in my head, okay, we're going live in three, and then I get really nervous as if I'm live on television. <laughs> well, it's good. You're teaching yourself. I mean, you've got what's called a um, a PA in your ear when yeah. you're on live telly, as you know, and um, they're, they're always talking to you. And we had this lovely lady called Lynn Calloway at Channel 4. Was, uh, Lynn was great. Leggy Lynn, we used to call her. She was about six foot tall. Okay. And you would say, okay, okay, cat. Uh, 30 seconds on air in this beautiful English cut glass accent. And then at the end of the show, she'd be saying to her, OK, 20 seconds to stop talking, cat, And you'd be there trying to wind it down. And, yeah. and one time, Lynn, I mean, Lynn never got her sums wrong. She was always, she had a stopwatch next to her. And one time she said to me, 30 seconds to stop talking. Then as I was winding it down, she said, oh, cat, I'm so sorry. It's a minute and 30 seconds to stop talking. And trying to fill that extra minute, Hannah, on live yeah. tell that is a... <laughs> oh, it doesn't feel like anything, does it? So I saw Eric standing next to me and called him over. Mac, reflections of the day, come on in. And Tanya, who's, who worked with Mac, was up there as well, and we got away with it, as they say. What's John like in, in what was he like in real life? Was he John a flamboyant because yeah, uh, he was on television? Yeah, well, he was, but it was an act, Hannah. He was, um, he was a performer, Mac, and um, a very different man behind the scenes, very shy. Oh, really? Yeah, he was, yeah. Oh. Um, but always the first man in when we were preparing for a broadcast. He'd, he'd do loads of prep, John, and um, he was, I mean, very funny, great sense of humour. Yeah. But when he was, when his mind was focused on the job, you know, he, he really was um, very focused. And another thing about Mac, although he was a showman and a bit of a show off when he was on air, yeah. uh, he was a team player, you know. If he, if he had a line that it wasn't his turn to speak, he would share the line with you and feed it to you so you could use it. And which is always very, that's very generous of him. And a lot of, I can tell you, most presenters would never do that. Really? Yeah, it's a lesson, it's a nice lesson to learn that, isn't it? Yeah. So if he had more... A statistic of something that he hadn't used yet and it made you look good. Because he, he'd finished his bit. Mm. He's, you, can, you can use that cap, use that. And I said, well, Matt, you said, no, 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 no. He said, you use it, you're on air, well, I'm not there. And he said, you use it and all this sort of stuff. So. Aww. It was great. I remember watching him on television. I mean, I was. This is when I was very, very young, and my granddad would sit and watch him. He was. A, I mean, he was a strange man, Hannah. Oh, don't get me wrong. He was. He was an. <laughs> he was a bit of an oddball, but uh, I thought he was great. I love working with him, and I was yeah. very. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have a question from my mum. So my mum's bonus question. She likes to add. Yeah, Mrs. Baycroft. Is she still? Mrs. Wilkins. Okay. Yeah. Right. Maybe. Maybe I should have like a own little section. Mrs. Wilkins' question of the day. Um. <laughs> She says, how difficult is it to commentate on a race when there's lots of runners and riders? Well, tell her it's difficult. I mean, <laughs> the, the, the key to it yeah. um, is learning your colours properly. Yeah. Uh, just got to remember that, um, you know, which horse is which. And, and the key time is when, when the horses canter down to the start, 
that's when you try and imprint those colours and names on your memory. Right. Uh, obviously, the more there are, the more of a <laughs> the more of a task it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but Anna, that said, if, if you've got a small field of five or six and you're not concentrating properly, you can often get tripped up by a small lineup. So you've got to be focused all the time. Yeah. yeah. It isn't easy, particularly on a sprint race. Yeah. Because it's so uh, it's so quick, isn't it? It's. So... Yeah, it is. Yeah, uh, it is. It's a different medium over jumps and flat. Mm -hmm. Jumps, you've got time. Yeah. Uh, and flat is is yeah, it's all over in a flash, isn't it? Most mm. most of the time, um, compared to the jumping, which goes on for a bit longer. But of course, with jumping, you're trying to work out who's been pulled up at the back, and yeah. trying to work, you know, if there's a horse makes a mistake in front of them, and trying to pick up the fallers. And I mean, you miss you miss things. Of course, you do. Is but, it you know, hard if there are silks that are similar? Similar. Yeah. Colors? Oh yes. I, I, I've often listen. I, there's been, probably been. Half a dozen times in my career, I've got the silks wrong, the wrong way around. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it happens. I mean, I've been commentating for, I'm trying to think when I first started, in 93 did I start. So what's that? That's a long time, isn't it? Crumbs. So 25, 27 years. Right. Yeah, hundreds of races. And of course, you're bound to get times when you make a mess of it. Of course, you, you do. And, um, I practiced in my head at Cheltenham, and it was very difficult. I was thinking, there's so many colours. I'm so confused. <laughs> Keep practicing because we need some female commentators out there. We do. Oh, the challenge is accepted. <laughs> You're going to be watching some old football matches during lockdown. It's been brilliant. Yeah, it's all going to sort of slowly start, isn't it? Yeah, I hope so. And uh, fingers crossed. I mean, there's no green light yet for Monday, but hopefully there will be mm. sometime today. I, I don't know. Everybody's trying their best to get things ready, but we can't do anything until the government says yes, can we? So would that mean it'll be sort of work from home with that situation? commentators and no the commentators we're, we're required to go to the track we've, we've got oh, okay. uh, got a certificate from the online COVID-19 guidance from the VHA and we've got to wear a mask when we get there and get tested oh really uh, yeah get, get our temperature done and yeah. then it'll take a while there aren't many people going to be going racing that mm. uh, are there like for us there'll be photographer, two photographers there and two journalists one commentator and one presenter I think is what yeah. they're saying yeah. And then the rest, of course, are grooms and, and etc. and, and um, race course officials. Well, that's good. At least it's beginning to start back. Yeah. Oh, God, I know. Let's, let's just hope it carries on, eh? <laughs> um, well, that's all my questions. Great. That is all my questions. Was... But thank you so much for letting me interview you. Oh, listen, it's an absolute pleasure. Any time, any time. It's excellent. All right, my lovely. Well, great to see you. And you. We'll speak soon. Yeah, take care all of us. Thank so you. Long. Bye. 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 Bye.